My name is Chris, though you might recognize my voice from another channel called Stoho, where I do various tutorial videos for Fantasy Grounds Unity. In collaboration with Smiteworks, I have been asked to create an updated quick start video to help you get up and running with a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign using Fantasy Grounds Unity. Fantasy Grounds Unity has far more to it today than when it was first released, with new features being added on a regular basis in addition to the application gaining new improvements over time. As a result, this quick start guide will be broken into two parts that are meant to be watched one after the other by both DMs and players. Between the two videos, we are going to look at the launcher screen, some of the basic application settings in the event that you've not yet entered your license key, as well as show you how to create or reload a campaign as a DM and how to join them as a player. Once we're in the campaign itself, I will show you how to access some of the internal game settings, quickly go over the modules and show how they should be loaded, explain how to set up your quick access bar, as well as load custom maps and assets. Finally, we'll also go over some explanation as to how to create a character, add that character to the party sheet, what the combat tracker is and how it works, and finally link a character into a map and show how that particular character can move around that map. As there is a lot of information to cover, I am not going to be going into too much detail, more or less just quickly cover the surface of everything there. Not like I usually do, as this is really simply meant to get you up and running into the campaign and get you having fun as quickly as possible. However, I will include links to the various wiki pages in the description below in the event that you might be looking for more detail. Now, once you have Fantasy Grounds Unity installed and have it started and are sitting at the launcher screen, you're going to see something that looks very similar to this. The left side of the launcher screen is going to show a series of options that you can make use of with the means to create or load campaigns as a DM, join one as a player, display the credits of the developers and other contributors, view the various application settings, as well as check for application updates. The middle of the screen contains the user manual links, a quick start guide, which we'll eventually be linking back to this particular video, the Fantasy Grounds Marketplace here, where you can purchase additional modules, as well as some quick help links here, if you will, in relation to requesting support or assistance from either the forums, support itself, or anything along those lines, as well as the release notes. If you do need help for some reason or another, the contact support button will take you to a wiki page that provides a number of options to help you get in touch with Smiteworks support. And here is what that wiki page currently looks like in relation to how you're going to gain access from the support teams, specifically the technical support, license, subscription, or billing support, as well as any assistance through the Forge. And there are some suggested links here that you can look at as well. The banner is going to show details about your account name, whether you're connected to the lobby, as well as the Fantasy Grounds Unity version and edition that you're currently licensed for and are running. And just for clarity, there are three editions of Fantasy Grounds Unity. They are the free or demo version, the standard, and ultimate editions, of which the standard or ultimate editions can also be a subscription. If this is your first time running Fantasy Grounds Unity, then this word here will most likely represent the free or demo edition alongside the version that you have here. And we will cover how to deal with adding your license key in a moment, as there are a few more things that I want to mention first. It should also be noted that Dungeon Masters and players should all be using the same version of Fantasy Grounds Unity, which is this numerical prefix here after the V character, as using a different version can cause issues for players. As a DM, once you have your campaign loaded, Anytime a character actually connects to your system, you will see in the chat box whether they are running a different version or not. And as a result of that, you're going to want to make them aware of that and have them update before they connect again. However, the additions themselves also have a set of rules with which they operate. For example, a dungeon master running the ultimate edition can support connectivity from all three editions of Fantasy Grounds Unity simultaneously whereas a Dungeon Master running the Standard Edition can only host games for those players using the Standard or Ultimate Editions at the same time. Adding a license is handled through the Updater Utility. So one second, I'm just going to click this, and then I will show you what the Updater Utility looks like. Clicking on the Settings button is going to close out that launcher screen and then open up this Fantasy Grounds Unity Updater Engine. 
and it is going to default you to the basic tab, as this is going to be the important tab for entering in your username and password, as well as your license key. The optimal order is to log in first by entering your credentials and confirming that it is good and then add your license key. Otherwise, you will end up having to validate your license key twice. Once everything has been validated, simply click on the Save button and you will be returned to the main screen of the Fantasy Grounds Unity Updater Utility, which you can then click on to either update the application to ensure that you're running the edition you're licensed for, or just simply go back to the Fantasy Grounds launcher. At this point, once you've returned to the launcher screen, the edition should be checked just to ensure that it matches what you purchased for your, either your perpetual license or your subscription. As a DM, creating a campaign is a little more complicated than simply double-clicking on something, as there are a number of things that you need to do before it's going to work. The first is to give it a unique name so that players can find it if you're going to list it publicly, or so that you can find it later on if it's a campaign that you might be running a little less frequently than others that you have on the go. In this particular case, I'm just going to simply call this Quick Start Guide. You will then need to ensure that you select a game system, or rule set as it's called, in order for Fantasy Grounds Unity to be able to function as a virtual tabletop application. As I am going to be presenting the 5th edition rule set here, I'm going to ensure that I select that particular game system. Now because of that, some options here are going to vary a little bit depending on the rule set that you have chosen. So if you're using this to bring up another rule set, some things will be a little bit different, both here at the launcher screen, as well as within the actual campaign in virtual tabletop software once it's up and running. The next thing that you're going to want to do is ensure that you configure a password if you want to be able to control who can join your campaign, and then decide whether you're going to list this on the cloud publicly or privately, or have it set up so that it's only accessible on your local network. If you have players that are accessing your campaign from the internet, then I recommend you choose either the public or private cloud options. However, if you have a good understanding of how firewalls work and can open up ports to allow internet-related traffic through to your campaign host, you can choose the LAN option instead and still allow players to connect in from the internet. I should also point out that at the bottom of the window are some IP addresses here that are related to your internal and external network IPs. Now, I have mine blanked out for the purposes of this recording, but the external and internal IPs will need to be provided to your players if you're making use of the LAN option. Otherwise, they are simply informational as the cloud lobby will take care of connecting players to your system for you. As a DM, if you have already created a campaign and are looking to bring it back up so that your players can connect to their next session, then all you have to do is make use of this load campaign button on the left side of the menu. This will update the right context to show you all of the campaigns that you have run in the past, and all you will need to do is simply double click on the campaign that you wish to load, or select it and then click the start button at the bottom right. If, however, you need to make some changes, such as adding in a new extension, or updating the password, or even changing the server type, this is the time to do it before you actually start up the campaign again. You also see the rule set that is specific to the campaign in question, though hopefully you already know what that is, but this is a nice feature for those who use many different game systems on a somewhat infrequent basis. As a player, you will want to click on the Join Campaign button, and if you've not already joined a campaign, then this history is going to be blank, unlike my system. But the cloud listing here, specifically those shown in the lobby, will contain several different games that are currently active. You can refresh this list any time that you want to, and Fantasy Grounds will just simply go out to the lobby server and pull out the most recent list of games that are currently running. And you will have information that is going to relate to that particular campaign, as well as to the Dungeon Master that is running it, and whether it requires a password or not. Now, in theory, you should actually already have the information from your Dungeon Master that is going to allow you to get connected to their particular campaign. And all you have to do is search for their name if they're listing their campaign publicly, and then once it's found in the list, simply double click on that selection in order to start connecting. And if there's a password, go ahead and type that in. However, I should point out that when you use this search box over here to look for the Dungeon Master name, the minute you find that name, it's simply going to automatically start connecting. So if I typed in Stohove right now and I had a Dungeon Master's campaign up and running, it would automatically go ahead and connect. This feature here is useful if the Dungeon Master has chosen to hide their campaign from the lobby, thus preventing you from being able to find it in the list. 
If it's a local campaign or the Dungeon Master is preventing their campaign via the LAN network, then you will simply want to type in the IP address here as well as the port number if they've decided to change it, at which point it should begin the connection process once you click start. I'm going to go ahead and load up both a Dungeon Master setup as well as a player setup because at this particular point in time, the video is going to diverge slightly. The first time you start a new campaign as a DM or connect to a campaign as a player, this campaign setup window is going to appear, and it's a mini wizard of sorts that will allow you to complete some of the initial setup. As a DM, it functions as a guided utility so that you can go through and preload all of the appropriate modules, provided you're allowing Fantasy Grounds Unity to assume what modules you want to load based on these particular options here, as well as go through and gain access to the options window, which will allow you to go through and, and configure some of the basic elements of the campaign, such as if you're going to have the dice tower enabled, whether you're going to allow manual rolls for their dice, or what the icons actually will look like and function like on the maps when they're placed in that particular given map, and many other options that are outside of the scope of this particular guide. Now, as a player, it behaves very much the same way, but you are going to have a little bit less flexibility as to what modules you can actually go through and load, depending on if the DM has chosen to block some modules from being loaded on the player side, which I'll go through and cover in the next section. But again, you do also gain access to the options window here, which looks like this in the event that I didn't show it earlier, except as a player, you're only going to be able to adjust these four elements. The dungeon master is the one that's going to be able to set the rest of these and you do get to see what those settings are once they are configured so that you can go through and just verify that nothing changed from one session to the next. Regardless as to whether you are a player or a dungeon master, you can go ahead and remove this check mark at the bottom to prevent this particular screen from loading again in the future. However, you can still gain access to that again through the options panel here and then simply going back to the setup button. So you're not totally lost if you need to find a way to get back to it. Now, also as a player, you are going to see this character selection screen each time you connect to the campaign, regardless of whether it's the first time you connect or not. But I'm going to get into more detail about this particular window a little bit later on. There are some other things I want to cover first. Regardless as to whether you're the dungeon master or the player, the first time you load a campaign window, you're going to want to make sure that you gain access to this modules button if you haven't already gone through and preloaded many of the modules that you want to go through and have ready to go inside of the actual campaign setup window when it was presented. And what this does is it loads the modules panel and it is used as a centralized access point for all of the campaign modules that both you as a dungeon master and the player are going to be utilizing during your campaign. As a player, you will not need to own any of these modules as the Dungeon Master system is going to provide them to your system at the time that you connect to it, and it will clear them out at the time that you disconnect, thus reducing the overall costs to the group as a whole to get things up and running. Now, as a Dungeon Master, the first thing that you're going to want to do if you haven't already loaded all of your modules is click on this activation button, and this is going to bring up this particular window here. Now, I have this filtered out, to show you the campaign that I'm going to use in this particular case, which is the Lost Minds of Fandelver. I'm simply going to go ahead and click on this to load that module. And you will see that it is loaded because the book is now open in reference to this particular icon. And this X here states that players cannot load this particular module on their side. However, I do believe there is a player's version of this particular module, but I'm not sure certain of that. The other thing that I will want to do as a dungeon master is search for the word player and then verify that each of these particular modules is one that you want a player to actually go through and load. So for example, I have the player's handbook as well as the Dungeon Master's Guide. So when players connect to my campaign, they don't need this basic rules. They just simply load up the player's handbook. So I can now block that from the player's perspective so that they can't even see it, thus they can't load it. And I'm going to want to go through and sort of filter out any player module that I feel isn't necessarily appropriate to the campaign in question. I'm also going to want to go through and make sure that I load up the Dungeon Master's Guide, although I didn't need to actually load the player's version of that particular module. Now, this does take a little bit of time to load because the Dungeon Master's Guide is fairly large, and on my system, it definitely takes a little bit longer than I think it really should. <laughs> However, once it's completed loaded, I'll go ahead and unload this. There we go. So now that's particularly set up. You'll also want to make sure that you have the player's handbook loaded, although you don't necessarily need it as a Dungeon Master. It does help. 
And if you have any other core rules that you want to make use of, for example, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, the Monster's Manual, or anything like that, you'll want to make sure that they are all loaded as part of the process. As a Dungeon Master, once you have all of the modules loaded, you will find them within your actual modules panel here, specifically your adventure campaign, any campaign guides that you might be using as a supplement, the core rules associated with Dungeons & Dragons itself, as well as anything to do with any supplements that you might have loaded, plus any extensions if you happen to have any. Now, as the player, if the Dungeon Master has taken the time to reduce the number of modules that you need to load, you will most likely simply just have to go through and load all of the modules that are here to ensure that you're up and running and ready to go and have the means to go through and create your characters, access items and equipment that you might need, spells or subclasses or backgrounds, etc, etc. Now, before I go into details on how to access the stories and create characters, I want to explain a nice capability of the interface that you should get used to using early on. As the Fantasy Grounds Unity application is meant to help both a DM and players optimize gameplay so that the focus is on the story and less on the mechanics, there are a number of helpful quick access options available within the interface. The most obvious of them is the hotbar that is at the bottom of the screen, of which there are a total of eight, although that itself is not as obvious. The first is available simply by making use of the F1 through F12 keys, which are here at the bottom. They line up with this number exactly. But you can also access up to seven other hotbars through the use of the control, the shift, the alt key, plus pairs of those particular combinations, which reveal three more, and finally by making use of all three combinations of those buttons to reveal the last bar. You will need to make use of the appropriate F1 through F12 key in combination with the various alt, control, and shift combinations that you have set up to gain access to the relevant object that you chose to store in that particular hotbar. And this allows you to link anything that you can drag and drop, be it a preset dice roll, a link to a specific skill, ability, manual page, or story element if you happen to be the Dungeon Master, and anything else that you can think of can be added to this particular hotbar. So for example, if I set up a quick access roll for, say, rolling 4d6 and drop 1, I can drag that down into here, and then when I click it, it will actually go through and make use of it, or I just hit the F1 key to do it again. Now, for those Dungeon Masters who don't want their players to go through and make use of the character wizard to be able to create characters, this particular die roll is highly useful for automatically calculating the reduction of the rolling of four dice total and removing the lowest, and all a player has to do is hit it six times, and then they have their stats. And there are more options and other shortcuts that you can review through the available wiki page that I'll link down in the description below. Fantasy Grounds Unity also has something called an Assets Panel, which is available through this particular button here on the right-hand side menu. And in this particular case, an Assets Panel is useful for helping the Dungeon Master manage and manipulate tokens, portraits, and images. And these can be custom images or maps that you have gone through and created, had made for you, or found online where the owner of the image is allowing you to download it and make use of it in their campaign, or in your campaign, I should say. As you can see here, prepackaged campaign modules also include all of their image assets and map assets grouped based on the actual campaign module. So for example, Eberron is here, we have Candlekeep here, so you don't necessarily have to have the module loaded to gain access to the assets. This will allow you to make use of them within your own campaigns, though if you do that, you would not be allowed to distribute that campaign outside of your own party and you would never be able to sell it, at least as I understand the rules and agreements that are in place between Wizards of the Coast and the rest of the community right now. I quite regularly have my players give me portraits or tokens for their characters, and the Assets panel is quite useful in quickly importing those assets and getting them assigned to the characters, because all I have to do is click on the Portraits button here, click on this folder button, copy the image into that folder button, and then simply hit this refresh button down here. As soon as I do that, there will be a new campaign folder that shows up here, or you'll see it available through this data folder here. And I keep double clicking, although that is a recent change. You don't need to double click on folders anymore to gain access to them. You can just simply click with one click. After that, all I really have to do is drag the token or portrait onto the affected character who uploaded it for me. 
And the same process works for any images, maps, scenic scenes that you want to add into your campaign, NPC or creature portraits, really anything that you can think of that's going to help add that visual weight to your campaign, as well as setting up the mood or portraying a specific scene in a way that's going to put your players in a specific frame of mind, things like that. As the Dungeon Master, your role is going to be to narrate the story and referee the various encounters, and Fantasy Grounds Unity is going to help you out quite a bit here. The Campaign button on the right-hand side expands down to show you the various panels that you'll be able to access and make use of, with the Story panel being one of the most important panels that you're going to want to get used to. Most of the pre-made campaigns are going to be broken up into various chapters, which you can access by scrolling through the story entries across the many various panel pages that exist in this particular case, or narrowing down that list by selecting the group. So in this particular case, I'm going to go ahead and select this Goblin Arrows one. And as you can see, by clicking on that particular group up here, I've narrowed down exactly what it is that I need to look through in order to find all of the elements related to this particular portion of the chapter. And in this particular case, I'm going to once again click on this Goblin Arrow story and open that up for us. One thing that I want to point out here is that you will periodically run into these particular chat bubbles, and these are descriptive chat boxes that are used to describe a location or situation to the players. Simply clicking on this bubble here will add it to the chat. However, these can also be used to represent a spoken element of a given MP, NPC or sentient object. Additionally, story pages will also contain links for relevant encounters, for example, if I go ahead and select on this goblin blind, we'll see an encounter link here. And we pop that open, we get to the encounters, which I'll explain in a bit. They can also contain experience parcels for quests completions, which will be much later on in this particular story, as well as things like loot parcels or NPCs that you might have to actually represent or deal with in relation to this particular location or chapter. And that is going to be for the most part, because there are some campaigns that don't always do that, but they are usually quite rare, at least at the time of this particular recording. All of these elements are also available through the modules panel, specifically to the adventure. You can find all of the individual concepts and items here, as well as in a reference manual that kind of reads like a book in the sense that it contains all of the pages and chapters that you need to go through to get to the various items that you'll want to go through and look at. And there's one thing that I want to point out here. You'll see here that this particular map isn't pinned, meaning that there's no pin references here to show you all of the various parts of this particular map and what you have to do about them. However, when you click on it, it will open up a map that is. So just keep that in mind in the future when we get to dealing with various maps and dealing with various elements that we need to go through and take a look at. And as anyone knows, a good story is not really any good if there are no characters to go along with it, and that's the same for a good Dungeons & Dragons campaign. As a player, once you've connected to your Dungeon Master system, what you are going to want to do is click on the Characters button here underneath the Player category. However, when you first connect to the server, this window is automatically going to open. To create your character, you have two options that you can go through and do that. You can make use of this character wizard, which is this little button up in the top left part of the corner here, or you can click on this little green item and go through and manually create a character. If you're not used to Fantasy Grounds, I highly recommend utilizing the character wizard. However, if you are used to Fantasy Grounds, I still recommend utilizing the character wizard because it simplifies things immensely at this particular point in time. Now, clicking that button opens up a window that looks like this. And one thing I want to point out here is that Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition provides four different ways that you can actually go through and create your stats. You're going to want to coordinate with the Dungeon Master as to which method they want to use. For my own campaigns, I typically use the dice roll. And as soon as I click that, as you can see, it goes through and rolls the dice and populates all of the stats based on that roll. Uh, that's not too bad a roll. It's pretty decent, actually, now that I think about it. I honestly don't know what character I'm going to go through and create here, so I'm simply going to go ahead and shove the 17 over here in the strength for the time being, and maybe move the 8 over to the charisma and leave everything else fairly well balanced. But that's literally all you have to do to move these values around. 
Now, if you've already chosen your race, then their adjustments to that particular stat will be displayed here. But if you haven't done so yet, you'll see zeros. But beyond that, all you're going to need to do is continue to follow through each of these tabs and deal with all of the particular items here that indicate that something is outstanding. And you will see a summary of that down here at the bottom. So let's say, for example, that I'm going to create a tiefling, for, for instance. Well, a tiefling also happens to have a subrace. So I'm going to go ahead and select this one. And then there's the racial modifiers. This is going to be whether you go with the default, where it automatically adjusts your stats here based on a default setting that is configured by that particular race, or you can go with option two by increasing three different ability scores by one. Now, I'm generally just simply going to do this for the time being so that I can move on to the next one. And it does show you as to which one it will do. Now, right now it's charisma, but I could change this to constitution, for example. In this particular case, I got to choose. And then continuing on, you have to deal with your class. So if I chose a fighter, for example, I'm going to go ahead and choose just some random skill proficiencies here and then continue on to the background because there's something here that I want to point out. And let's see if I can lock in and do this. I'm going to select gladiator. You'll notice that the class button here went back from green to a red exclamation mark. And we'll, I'll show you why in a second. And I'm just going to choose pan flute. And the reason for that is that I ended up choosing a background that happened to have a conflicting skill proficiency. So it deselected one of the ones that I had selected here in favor of actually allowing you to have another choice. I'm going to select perception in this case. And then finally, before moving on, you will have a couple of other buttons that will appear. Things like your inventory, spells, and feats, if there happen to be any feats, based on the type of racial setup that you went through and set up. For example, Tasha's allows you to configure a feature, whereas most of the other classes don't always allow you to go through and set a feature. Now, inventory, I'm just going to go ahead and grab a couple of items here, and apparently I get uh, several. Dungeoneer's pack and a horn, and outside of the armor choice here, I'm going to go with chainmail. I am now essentially done, and if you need additional equipment, you can go ahead and purchase it here. However, for our example, I'm just simply going to put in a name. Make sure that I have no feats that I have to choose, which in this case I don't. And then I'm going to commit that, and I now have a character, or will in a second. There we go. The only thing outstanding is a portrait and a token. Now the Dungeon Master is going to have to assign you the token, but a portrait you can import into your system and then go ahead and choose one. Now I'm going to borrow one of my players' own portraits that I think they used a couple of campaigns ago, just as an example in this particular case. Now, to continue on with the rest of this particular demonstration, if you will, I've gone ahead and imported several characters that I've prepared for this particular campaign. And this is everything that we're going to cover in this particular part of the video. And while I went through an explanation of each area quite quickly, you will find a number of links in the description below. These links are going to take you to various wiki pages associated with the topics that were covered in the video in the event that you have more questions about them or need a more complete explanation. Additionally, they may also take you to a single link that might act as the root node for all of the other links associated with some combination of the topics that we've covered in this particular video as well. So with that, let's continue on with the second part of the Quick Start Guide, and I will see you in the next video.